Hi, this is Bob Novella. I'm with the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, and I'm at Skepticon 2019 in Melbourne, Australia, having an amazing time. Um, I've, I'm co-host of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. Uh, we've been a podcast for since 2005. We've done uh, weekly over 750 podcasts. Um, it's, a, it's such a huge number. It's a little intimidating at times, but we've been pretty every week. We have not missed a week since 2005, which is something of a, a badge of honor, I think, because uh, a lot of podcasts, uh, it's hard for them to stay consistent for so long. So, so we, uh, we talk about critical thinking and, uh, and uh, alternative medicine and uh, skepticism. My focus is primarily on science communication, so I talk a lot about physics and astronomy, material science, things like that. And uh, so we've been doing that for a while, and uh, we've got lots of great listeners that are always interacting with us, and, uh, and we go to different conferences. And uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good overview of uh, our podcast. Material science is something of one of my big interests, especially, you know, it used to be called nanotechnology. You could still say nanotechnology is maybe reserved now for... Um, marketing <laughs> yeah but yeah there's a lot of hype about there out there about nanotechnology but then on the other hand there's this big promise of if we can achieve something like atomically precise uh manufacturing then hey you know that'd be great a lot of things we could do with that yeah, it's one of those. It's one of those technologies like artificial intelligence that had a lot of amazing initial hype and expectations, and it hasn't quite matched where, where we, we thought it was going to go. When I first heard about nanotechnology decades ago, I figured by now, by 2020, 2019, we'd certainly have some major, major advances uh, in nanotech that would be obvious, and we really haven't seen anything at a, at a big scale. Nothing that's even a closing mature nanotechnology. But I still think that we will reach a point at some point in the near future, hopefully, where we do really have atomically precise manufacturing, where we could really create, like, you know, normal scale, big scale things, like maybe, imagine a, la a laptop created with nanoscale, with, with, with perfect precision. I mean, it would be a, a supercomputer, teraflop supercomputer that we could fit in the palm of your hand. Um, that's not to say we've had, you know, we haven't had some amazing advances in, in miniature computer technology, but uh, I still think nanotechnology's time uh, will come, and it's going to be an amazing tool. It'll be a double-edged sword like anything else, like cars. Cars are great. We can't live without cars, but thousands, tens of thousands of people die every year, and we would never consider getting rid of a car. So nanotech will be a tool that we need to research and talk about and anticipate, uh, you know, a, you know, very, uh, you know, horrible uses of, of that technology. It can do amazingly terrible things. The whole gray goo thing comes to mind. Uh, but the thing is, if you have nanotech and the bad guys have nanotech, then you could use your nanotech to, to make the situation better and deal with their evil nanotech. So it's better that a lot of people, you know, like countries, you know, modern Western countries will have that and, uh, and not have it like go into the recesses of the, of the government and no one knows what's going on. It's good to keep it open. And we'll, so we'll see what happens. But it's, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be an important but scary technology. Interestingly, I was talking to some people who um, uh, track the progress in Moore's Law and chip manufacturing, and we're getting to the end of um, Moore's Law, so to speak, um, and the, lith the lithography can only go so far as the light wavelength can etch into a chip. But beyond that, there might be a market push to um, focus on more of the bottom-up, proper molecular nanotechnology Sure. Manufacturing. And that's, yeah, that's, that's a thing that nanotech could help, or maybe even femtotech or adotech, if you even go to smaller scales. Um, yeah, I think by, by necessity, we will start trying to think of creating transistors that are at the scale of, you know, an atom, an electron, or, or whatever. And, but we will, reach, we will reach, at some point, the limit, the physical limit of, of, you know, density, of computer density, what they, what's it called, computronium, where it, by the laws of physics say you just can't get any more dense than that. We, we will reach that point at some point, and then it's going to be an interesting time because things aren't going to be improving as dramatically um, as they have been. It will just be continued refinement, but uh, I don't think we need to worry about that for a little while, but, but we could kind of see it on the horizon. But, um, but I think Moore's Law will continue beyond the conventional substrates that we're using now. Uh, it kind of has... Throughout history, it's kind of as we went from different media 
to another from like vacuum tubes to, uh, to other technologies. We kind of, Moore's law kind of, if you track it, kind of kept pace. So I think we'll, we'll, you know, we'll continue for a little while, but who knows when, it's gonna, when that will happen and that, that day will come. But it'll be nice to, you know, to, to reach the limits of uh, you know, something like atomic scale uh, you know, density and for memory or CPUs. It'd be cool to see that happen. Yeah, I'd like to see Emto yeah. and Addo and Yotto technology. Yeah, and right, and who knows what exotic technologies we that we aren't even conceiving of now that could take advantage of some weird physical processes that haven't even been discovered yet. You know, who who knows? Look, could you put an actual date and perhaps a time in the afternoon the singularity will occur? Oh boy, uh, predicting the singularity. Um, I, I'm kind of done trying to predict the singularity. I've, I did it. I've tried it in the past. It's so hard to, to predict it. But I think. Uh, and even the definition, what does singularity mean? People have different definitions of singularity. My definition of singularity encompasses a period of time called an intelligence explosion, when our systems become so intelligent, that so beyond super, uh, human intelligence, that you can't predict what's going to happen. How do you predict what a superhuman intelligence will, can do or will do if we're just human? It's like your dog trying to predict what you're gonna do tomorrow. It has no conception of, of how to make that prediction. So the, so the timelines in the future that we can predict will be coming closer and closer and closer, and eventually it'll become a point where we can't predict even a few weeks in the future because things are changing so fast because of this explosion, this intelligence explosion. To me, that's a pretty good definition of what a singularity is. So then when I say singularity, that's what I refer to. Um, I think it's going, it will happen. Everything, everything points in the direction that that will happen. And I, do, I can't imagine a reason why we would stop approaching that, even if it's not to specifically achieve a singularity. There's so many benefits you get on the way to singularity that we're not gonna stop, we're not gonna stop going there. And it, it would take a, you know, a, a nuclear holocaust to stop that kind of advance. We're just gonna keep marching forward and who, who knows what's gonna be happening, but it's not gonna be a boring ride and I hope I'm around to see it happen. Yeah, intense. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, we, what do the goldfish know of Mozart? Is what Bernadette said. <laughs> yeah. He coined the term uh, the technological singularity. Yes. Yeah. So, I've, I've, I've done a few interviews with him. He's oh, great. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that interests me. Um, as we as we create intelligences that are beyond. Uh, human level intelligence or augment our own intelligence, which is also, I think, a fascinating possibility. Um, I, I think we'll encounter things that, like a goldfish and Mozart, uh, or your, I, the example I use is a dog in algebra. Uh, you take the smartest dog that has ever existed, you will never teach it algebra. You just can't conceive of anything in that way. So what is it out there that, you, that human level intelligences cannot conceive because of the complexity of our brain? It's just not up to snuff. And so once we augment ourselves or create um, an artificial intelligence, what can they conceive of that we could never conceive of? That's a fascinating idea. And who knows what we could learn once we achieve that level of complexity. I, there's got to be something out there that, that we just can't, can never conceive of. We can't, we're not the smartest thing that's, that's conceivable. So. That's another thing I hope to I hope to see. Like, what's out there that we just can never know until we augment ourselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, th you mentioned a double-edged sword before. One of the um, concerns that, like, I share with a lot of the the, the people um, who are doing a lot of futurological research at the Future of Humanity Institute, the Center of the Cambridge Center for Existential Risk and such, is the um, possible impact on the mind-blowing amount of possible lives that could be achieved in the future if everything goes well, right? But if things go sideways or pear-shaped, that, that could be a, a massive issue. Like, it, it's like, does a future life, does it have moral weight? Are we, we, should we be concerned about the possible life in the future? If we went extinct, um, and there'd, there'd be no sort of chance of a beneficial singularity, then that could possibly, like, uh, waste a lot of future life. Hmm. That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. How much? I mean, how much respect do you owe future future humanity? I mean, I can think in terms of my children and grandchildren. I think we deserve we they deserve even though they don't exist. They deserve to have a planet that's inhabitable. That's not uh, has does not have runner runaway climate change. So so in that regard, I, I we do owe that to them because it's, it's so much more tangible and close to us. But when you go 
down to succeeding generations, you know, centuries in the future, do we, what, what do we owe them? That becomes a little bit more nebulous um, and hard. It's hard, you know, on one hand, you don't want to restrict what you can do um, because of some possible future descendants that may have a problem with it. I think that our descendants will look back at us and be like, what were these guys thinking? And I think they will have problems with us in ways that we can't even anticipate now because they will be so different from us. And, and then when you start thinking about transhumanism and nanotech and, and, and uh, singularities, I think they will be so far beyond human that we, they would be unrecognizably. So, so to think that we should do things for them, it's, it's a little bit problematic, but we should definitely be thinking about it, especially when it comes to like kids and grandkids and great grandkids. I definitely want to leave them a world that, that's safe and, uh, and free from things that we have control to change. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll look, could, on. Could, look, could I just ask you one question yeah. that stumps just about all critical thinkers? Pick a song that you think is great, a piece of music that you think is great, and there is no wrong answer for it. And you've got that look on your face that most critical thinkers ask. I'm, I just ask a question about music, and everyone's worried suddenly that they're going to give a wrong answer when there isn't one. Why do you think that is? Um, I think, well, for me, it's, it's more of... Well, my well, people think my choice is ridiculous. Like, and and who cares what other people think when it comes yeah. to music? That's such a personal thing. Yeah. But my knee jerk was like, oh, which one do I pick? Is it going to be a cool song that other people are going to think, oh, that's a cool song, Bob? Or are they going to think that's ridiculous, Bob? What are you, a little kid? You like this song? Come on, give me a break. So that's what was going through my mind. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, because and, and to, the shift from the science and things that we're talking about to the other side of the coin of of things that are value judgments that are kind of different. It kind of throws you for a little bit, so that's why you saw that. Like, uh, what's, yeah. what do I say? What do I say? Yeah, but, but it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great it's question. No one at a convention ever right. Came. And what's the first song that floats to the top of your head? And bear in mind, listener, there's no wrong answer. Well, it's it's uh, we're just into December, so for me, Halloween wasn't too far away. And my first thought is like, this is Halloween uh, from the movie Nightmare Before Christmas. So I, I listen to that song over and over as I'm doing my various Halloween projects. So that pops to mind. This is a great, this is a great fun song and a great fun. Movie. Movie, so that's what popped in my head. But there's so many. I had you. It's like picking your favorite kids. Back to the side. Okay. To the side. <laughs> well, let, let's talk. Let's focus on then value theory. Um, do you think there's anything like science is all about objectivity in trying to make sense of the world? Mm -hmm. Do you think um, anything about our values can should be at least informed by objective um, measurements about the world? And if so, how, how much should we be informed by objective measurements about oh, the world? Oh, I, I think we need definitely to be informed. A lot of, that, that's a lot of what politics is about. It's a, it's a lot about value judgments that you can't say, well, science says that we should value this. That, that's something that science can, can never do. But science can inform it. And I, I think, in, especially in, like in American politics, if they use science more to inform their political value-based decisions, it would be a much, it would be a much better world but people have their ideologies and if you if your science facts doesn't match with your ideology then you can you kind of push away the science and uh, and then and then the negative the negative aspects just flow from that so I think I think we really need to take that seriously of using science to inform our, our judgments that are value-based but when once you you know once you have the science and then you base your value judgments on the science then you really you can't really complain as much because you at least you you use the science and your value judgments aren't based on just pure emotion and ideology and not the science. Incredible, yes. Um, well, um, yeah, so, okay, what, what is your favorite prediction anybody's made about the future? Could be Kurzweil, could be anybody. What's your, and, and where have they went wrong or right? Um, let's see, I, I mean, I like the predictions dealing with the singularity and, and artificial intelligence and when we're gonna have artificial, and real, like artificial general intelligence. They, those predictions are, I was very encouraged years and years ago when they were saying 2020, 2030, and I'm like, great, because I, because a lot in my life, I want to see a, some of this stuff before I inevitably, you know, sh what's the what's the expression? Uh, turn to dust. Yeah, turn to dust. So that's a good one right there. So I want to see. There's some things that I want to see. I want to like before I go, I want to see artificial general intelligence. I want to see some level of mature. Techno nanotechnology. I want to see a moon base alpha. Some things that, that I want to see. So those predictions that kind of um, and you know reinforce my those desires are 
are, I love those predictions. But now as I get older, I realize that, you know, it's so easy to be over, over, overly optimistic for these predictions. And I realize some things are just going to take way too, way, you know, many more decades than we ever anticipated. It's just way too complicated. And that's one of the things I've learned in the skeptical movement and science communication is that, that over time you realize that, that once you get down into the weeds, some things are so more complicated, orders of magnitude more complicated than you ever anticipated that they would be, that these predictions are just it's folly. They, you know, th these time frames are just way too uh, optimistic. And some things I'll never see, but, but who knows? Um, I, I have hope that things will happen and be invented and discovered that I never even anticipated. Like, tw like 30 years ago, I never would have imagined that having this supercomputer in my pocket um, it's just an amazing invention that that I didn't I didn't see coming, or even things like the World Wide Web. Who I mean, who not many people see stuff like that. My and my favorite example of that is um, sound recording. Sound recording, like video, like movies and things. People predict people like rockets. People will predict it, and then eventually it happens. But I like the inventions that happen that nobody even saw coming. I think I think sound recording was one of the first, and when that was invented, people were like, whoa! I mean that. It's, imagine the surprise of having a recorded sound that you'd never even anticipated could be done. Uh, those, those are always the, you know, the most interesting uh, inventions. Fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Enjoyed Great it. Great to have you in Australia. Thank you. Yeah, it's really good too. <laughs> Cheers. Whew. All right. <laughs>